Well, we started some time ago with this preaching series um, about changing my thinking, and today I want to speak about changing our wrong thinking patterns. You know what, sometimes we just don't get it right. Sometimes we, we just don't think right, and Mias is just sick. Um, where God gives us direct word and we just don't listen to it. It is very easy to bring a whole lot of wrong thinking baggage with me into the church. Um, but if I'm striving to be more like Jesus, then the Holy Spirit comes into my life and starts to change my mind. The first picture, please. He, and it's almost like God taking a wrecking ball. You know what a wrecking ball is? Those big metal balls that they swing on a chain against a wall to knock it down. <clears throat> and sometimes God needs to, <clears throat> through the power of the Holy Spirit, take a wrecking ball and wreck my way of thinking. Because sometimes my thinking is just so wrong. And then I start influencing people around me. And I'm going to speak to us this morning out of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. So please take out your Bible or your smartphone or whatever, however you've brought your Bible with you today. Um, and keep it open because as I go through the sermon, I'm going to keep going back and back and back to the book of Acts chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. And before I read this, let me just give you context for you. In the early Christian church, I'm talking about the Christian church that, that started just after the death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, um, that started under James and had the elders and the deacons and, and started the home worship and started breaking bread, um, still went to the synagogue morning and evening. Um, but these were people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah that Jesus was the one who had come to save them from their sins. All the people who belonged to this church, this Christian church, were Jews. They were not Gentiles. So when Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, go into the world and make disciples of all men, they read it as go into all the world and make disciples. wanted to join this group of believers you had to MacGyve and become a Jew to MacGyve means to to change your religion it took about three years in order to MacGyve and it takes about the same time today if a Gentile want, wants to become part of a Jewish synagogue especially a man it'll take you about three years because you had to be circumcised. You had to obey all the kosher laws. And I'm sure you know the kosher laws. You can't eat the meat from an animal with a split hoof or that does not chew the cud or a fish that does not have scales or any animal bird that preys on another animal bird fish. Uh, observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You had to attend morning and evening worship at the synagogue or at the temple. You had to be baptized by full immersion and you had to make a public confession of your faith. Anybody want to become a Jew? Three years now. And the, the time setting of, of this reading in the book of Acts is around seven years after the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, round about. The church is still Jewish, although they believe in Messiah. So we can call them Messianic Jews. But Gentiles are not part of this church. And so I pick it up. 
Acts chapter 11 from 1. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles, these people who had not yet MacGyved, they were not part of this church, had also received the word of God. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. Who argued with him? The Jews. Those of the circumcision. Okay. Saying, you went into, it, into uncircumcised men and you ate with them. This was unheard of. You, you were not allowed to go into a Gentile's house because that made you unclean. Let alone eat with them. Now those of you who have been with me to Israel will know that in the morning you will get milk and cheese and no meat. In the evening you will get meat but no milk and cheese. Kosher law. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa at Simon the Tanner's house. Next comes a very important word. If you if you underline in your Bible, underline this next word. I was in the city of Joppa. Praying. And in a trance, I saw an object descending like a great sheet, being let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creepy things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed you must not call common or unclean. Just as this was done three times and all was drawn up again into heaven at that very moment, Three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me, Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them and upon us at the beginning, as at the beginning, at the day of Pentecost. Then I remembered the word of the Lord and he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should withstand God? <clears throat> and when they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted the, the Gentiles repentance to life. A whole mind shift had to take place in this reading. A whole mind shift had to take place. And Peter speaks to the, the Jews in Jerusalem very gently about this. He doesn't come with anger, but he just speaks gently. You see, God had to change Peter's way of thinking to enter into Cornelius' house. Now we know that this man was Cornelius, because in chapter 10, I'll just read chapter 11, chapter 10, we are told that it was Cornelius. God 
decided to change Peter's way of thinking to enter that house. A little while ago, a young man asked me a question, and the question was, why did God create us? And I was scarcely finished answering that question when it was followed by another question. So this young man said to me, if that's why God created us, then what is our purpose here on earth? And I think that this reading in Acts 11, 1 to 18 answers these questions for us today. Thanks, he. You see, God's sovereign purpose is salvation of all people <clears throat> from every nation. When Jesus says to the disciples in Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world and tell not only the Jews, but tell all nations about me. We need to start listening. The Jews believed in the gospel, but for Gentiles to believe in this gospel was actually inconceivable because Gentiles were heathen. They were not as pure and set aside as the Jews. And the Jews believed that no others could be saved. And when they hear what Peter has done, they begin to gripe. They begin to argue. <clears throat> and they're arguing because A, he went into a Gentile's house, and B, he ate with them. You see, God not, not, needed not only to change Peter's thinking, but he had to change the people of the time's thinking. Folk in the Bible starts repeating stuff to us, like in chapter 10 and then in chapter 11. Because it means to God this is important. God wants to change our way of thinking today so that we can begin to attain God's sovereign purpose. There's a world of difference between the world's way of thinking and God's way of teaching. If I read Revelation 7, I read about the 24 elders who are at the throne, in the throne room, at the throne of God where they say blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days you've just sung. They carry on and they say salvation. We also read in Revelation 7 that salvation belongs to our God. Salvation does not belong to us. We do not bring anybody to conversion. We plant the seed. The Holy Spirit does the rest. It is not about us. Must I push a button? No, it is green. Green. If I push it, it's going to go red. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul calls this the mystery of the gospel. It is something that we don't fully comprehend or understand. So if I go back to Acts chapter 11, I realize that this mystery is proclaimed to me in virtually every verse of these 18 verses that I read here. Because salvation belongs to God. Thank you, Dennis, not to me. And you know what? God uses a very weak person, a person who denied him, to go and preach the message. God did not use a strong person. He used Peter. Because God does not rely on my opinion as to who 
he's going to use. And when Peter argues with Jesus, when Peter argues with God in this vision as to not to go to this Gentile's house, God tells him in no uncertain terms that mission is not optional. We are all called to do this. We're not all called to go, to pack our bags and go, but we are all called to pray, to be educated about mission, and to support and encourage. In this church, we are pretty strict about setting aside 10% of everything that is given here to this church, to our outreach projects, to reach others, and to make a sustainable difference. On Thursday night, I was informed that one of the young people in our church um, has the opportunity to go on a mission trip starting on the 16th of December. we need to help her get there. Now you know, all of you who come here Sunday by Sunday will know that I never speak about money. I show you where the offering baby. But I'm asking you to, to take this word from God today and help me get this young girl on this mission trip. The folks can't afford it. But we as a church can. And I know I can go to my senior executive of this church and ask them if we could possibly um, give her the money to go from the church, but I don't want to do that. I want each and every one of us here to get involved and get behind this goal. And if your contribution brings one person to the Lord, while she's away on this mission trip. It's enough. If you would like to support her, then please will you see me after the service today. And then I'll check with Nikki and arrangements can be made and we can see how we do this because I don't understand the financial technicalities, Nikki knows that. We can't all go but we can all help. It's what God has called us to do. It's time for us to, to shift our thinking. It's just amazing. I write my sermons on a Wednesday and then I refine and play with until Sunday morning comes. And, and this happened on Thursday night after the local preachers meeting. You see, God's mission on this earth is that men need to be saved. When I say men, I, I refer to people. Wesley said, all men or women can be saved, or must be saved, all must be saved to the ultimate because there's no distinction. There's no one who cannot be saved. And we need to go to the ends of the world to go and teach this message of salvation to all people. And you know where it begins? It begins here. It begins here in our local church. Our local church should be radical. And in many ways we are. In many ways we are. Out of all the churches in Centurion, I think we're one of three who actually pack food on a regular basis to make sure that people have got something in their tummies. If that's not mission and outreach, then I don't know what is. You know what, a church is not a monument for saints. Rather, it's a hospital for sinners. And that includes you and me. Thank you. 
But we need to acknowledge that it's very easy to bring wrong thinking into our church and into our Christian lives. And we start mixing God's truth about church and our own ideas and somebody else's whim and fancy and then we make it law. What did God tell us as a church to do? To look after those who can't look after themselves and to worship Him. But we've got a myriad of other rules and regulations and there are three things that that we bring into the church that is so wrong and the first is human tradition that becomes more important than biblical truth and we drag with us our, our traditions and our way of doing things and we say that's what God wants no, the Jewish people said to Peter, no, you can't go into a Gentile's house. You can't eat with him because that's against our kosher law. We've made that rule. God didn't make that rule. And then they grow up and pick at Peter. And so often we do exactly the same. Another thing we do is that we, we believe that people... Um, the church should consist of people like me. You know the way I think, the way I do things, the me. Then it's a good church. Almost like this church. Play that video clip for me, please.
whole thing the way I should act. And this brings about a spirit of pride, and it brings about a spirit of division in the church. When people look like me, and they behave like me, and they speak like me, then this church will be right. But then God steps into our situation and changes our wrong thinking so that we can join with him in the salvation work for all. You see, this church, and Andy, is God's church. It's not my church. We are God's family. We are to treat each other in that way. The other thing that hinders this is that I believe that God has to do things my way. The Jews believed that in order to be a believer, to be a Christian, to belong to this group of people who believed in, in Yeshua, HaMashiach, you needed to be a Jew. God, do it our way. We are the people. And when God chooses Gentiles, this just doesn't fit the Jewish way of thinking. And God is not being fair. But I want to say to you today, unequivocally, God is always going to confront your wrong thinking. Folk, when I'm in disagreement with a word, then my way of thinking has to change. Not God's way of thinking. My way. When I take this word and interpret it to suit myself, then my way of thinking has to change. The test of my wrong thinking can always be found in the word. Those stubborn Jews needed to change their way of thinking. And you know what happens? Look at the last verse. They fell silent. They didn't know what to say to Peter. Maybe that was when the wrecking ball hit the wall. And all of a sudden, all their fancy ideas no longer meant anything. Note to self, this is good news for stubborn people because God can change a stubborn heart. I have the next slide. God changes our wrong thinking so that we can join him in his work just as this young girl is going from us to a mission field. And she will go with our blessing. And I can tell you now that we will pray over her before she goes. And I can promise you now that I will pray for her every single solitary day from now until she gets back. The dream is to go into the mission field, but God is sending this young girl. And my job is to pray for her. You see, God changes our wrong way of thinking so that we can join him in our work. Peter's first response to this I find in verse 8, where he says, um, But I said, Not so, Lord. Um, it's never wise to put the word no and Lord in the same sentence. Please, it's not wise. Change your thinking. Peter realizes that he cannot argue against God. And so he goes. And God needs to change our thinking so that we can go. And he changes our thinking, thanks, he, in six ways. In six ways. There's six ways in which God will change my thinking, thanks, he. The first one is that God changes me when I walk with him. When I read through the passage, I stopped. Um, in that verse where it says, 
can't find it now. While Peter was praying, God gave him a life-changing vision. There's something about being disciplined in your prayer life. If you want to speak to you want God to speak to you, then can I ask you to begin praying? You want God to teach you, then can I ask you to have a quiet time? Can I ask you to please spend time with God? Because it wasn't while Peter was walking or while he was sitting at Simon the Tanner's house or while he was moving from Jerusalem to Joppa, which is not a long distance. It's not while he was doing something. It was while he was praying that God starts speaking to him. And that needs to catch our attention. We cannot walk with God if we don't know him. If we don't know his word, there's very little chance that we will catch step with God and do things the way he would do it. We're not just Christians on a Sunday. I've asked you this question before, who are you tomorrow morning? The second way that God helps us change our mind, thanks he, is by putting us into uncomfortable circumstances. I don't know when last you've been moved right out of your comfort zone. When you've been asked to do something which is so not you. I don't know when, when God has asked you to do something that is so not you. I know how often I've packed my bags and run for the hills when I know that God is asking me to do something because it's uncomfortable and he's moving me out of my comfort zone. There are times when I feel so inadequate, when I feel so totally ill-equipped, but yet I know that I need to do what God is asking me to do. And I'm facing that situation right now. Where I feel inadequate and I feel ill-equipped. We say that we'll never go down here, I'll never do that again, but you know what? God says to me, never say no and Lord in the same, in the same set. I can't do what I need to do in my own strength. And the only way I can rely on God's strength it's when I begin walking with him on a daily basis, not on an ad hoc basis. Thanks, he. And when I don't get the lesson the first time, then God repeats the lesson. If you find yourself back in the place where you were last time, then you can be sure that you never learned the lesson. Because God will take you back to that beginning point and start teaching you the lesson all over again until you become his hands and feet. God repeats this lesson to Peter in this passage in, in Acts 11 three times. Until Peter gets it. And he goes with the three men who then become six men and I sometimes wonder who the other three are because three came into the house. But he leaves with six. We're not told who they are. I can guess. But Peter had to learn the lesson then. Peter, you're going to listen to me. Because I've got a bigger plan. Sometimes God speaks to us through a sermon, a piece of music, a book. Sometimes God takes his wrecking ball and blows all my preconceived, wonderfully formulated, incredibly planned ideas to nothing. Reuben Ross, who is a man I really respect, says, God does not give you a test that you either pass or fail. God gives you a test that you either pass or repeat. Can I say that again? God does not give you a test that you either pass or fail. He gives you a test that you will either pass or repeat. Because if God wants you to do something, my friend, let me tell you right now, that desire to do it is not going to go away. Tennis will tell you that. His desire to preach doesn't matter how hard he tried to run away from it, just never went away. And that's why we preach. Because the desire is there. 
And once God plants that desire in our hearts, it's not going to, to go away at all. Thanks. The next thing that God does is he changes us through his word. Peter wins over the Jews in Jerusalem because he speaks God's word back to them and he tells them everything that God has done. Me yes, you have a responsibility and Jackie so do. We need to tell people what God has done. I was so touched the other day when when our daughter-in-law in New Zealand couldn't wait um, for a decent time in South Africa to post something on our prayer warriors group. And, and all it said was, here comes a praise report. Because she needed to tell us what had happened. When we act correctly and we're in line with God's word, then everything is going to fall into place. You see, Jesus is the Messiah of all, not some. Not some. I think we're going to be surprised who we're going to find in heaven one day when we get there. Peter reacted to God's word and not to his own thoughts. Thanks, he. God changes us by reminding us that he is sovereign and that we are limited. God gently reminds us that he knows all and I actually know very limited, very little. God reminds me that his scope is unlimited and often I walk through life with tunnel vision. Folk, we are not Lord of this church. Jesus is. And it doesn't matter whether we're sitting in a cathedral, or sitting in a tent, or sitting under a tree. God does not have to consult with us to find out if what we, what we want God wants us to do what he wants. And if we expect God to consult with us, we end up by standing in the way of God with our little agendas. We're limited. We need to get out of it. Thank you. God changes us, and this is the last point so that he can use us in greater ways to fulfill his sovereign purpose. You see, God wants to use you in an incredibly great way. Just in the same way Philip stepped out and took the gospel into Africa when he met with the Ethiopian eunuch. The other stayed in Jerusalem. God had to let them face persecution in Jerusalem. And you know what? The Jerusalem church never, ever got over it because they honed in only on themselves. And you know what, as the book of Acts goes on, we hear less and less and less of the church in Jerusalem. And we start hearing more of the churches outside of Jerusalem because we cannot limit God to our own little sphere. If you don't do what God is calling you to do, God's gonna use someone else. You know what's going to happen? You miss the blessing. You miss the blessing. So my friends today, if you've been limiting God, please stop. If you need God to change your way of thinking, then take his word, submerge yourself in his word, and allow God to start speaking to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much that you take a story about Peter and Cornelius to make me realize I need to change my way of thinking. That I need to get in line with you. 
and with your way of thinking and not with what I am. So God help us today to submit. Submit to your Lordship. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you now and forevermore. Amen.